with Zeb Stewart. All right, with excitement, allow me to introduce to you today's guest, Zeb Stewart. My man, Zeb, are you feeling unstoppable today? <laughs> oh, man, I knew you were going to ask me that. <laughs> um, I think, uh, you know, the, the restaurant is an ultimate team sport, so I'd say that my team is definitely unstoppable. Nice. I will take it. So Zeb Stewart has a history of success in Brooklyn, New York as a designer and an owner operator of the Cheris Williamsburg Hotspots Union, Union Pool, Hotel Damano, uh, and Cafe Colette. Zeb has played a significant role in the growth and development of the neighborhood social scene over the years. In 2016, Zeb joined forces with uh, Judd. I'm going to say his name wrong. Say it for me one more time. Mungel. <laughs> Judd Mungel and yeah. Warren Baird to uh, focus on bright side hospitality. Uh, with their over 60 years of combined experience, the trio wow. offers a full range of consulting services. I cannot wait to dive into your story and your knowledge, but let's get that motivational, inspirational ball rolling with a success quote or a mantra. What do you got for us? I think I got a mantra, and I think it's one that you know everybody will agree with, and that's just that authenticity is everything mm, authenticity is everything really dissect that for me why is it so important uh i think especially when you you go to build your first restaurant you know you have to build it for yourself um you can't chase the cool as people say you know it's like especially now with social media and stuff it has to come from somewhere real and i think now we can just we can just tell when it's not it's you so know. much easier to be real every day than it is to show up and try to be something you're not too, right? Yeah, and also you've got to do that. Like when you open this restaurant, you've got to do this thing for like years, right? Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully yeah. years, right? So you can't live a lie, <laughs> you know? So it's like, it's got to be something that's true to yourself. And I think now like the, you know, the BS detectors on, we can just all tell. Oh my them. God, I'm sorry but, you're saying that because yeah. I was about to add on to like, people are just bombarded by bullshit fakeness yeah. all the time. It's all promotion. So, it's all, yeah. Exactly. Hype. So if you can go someplace that's just genuine, authentic and real as a guest, that must be so refreshing. Like, yeah. And I think that, you know, if, if you build, I mean, I've been so lucky because I kind of developed in a developing neighborhood. So I was always building places that I wish I could go to. And I think that, you know, if you're building your first place for yourself as a client, for your group, for your friends, for like what you wish was there, you can't, you can't mess up, you know, because you know if you're hitting or not, because you're like literally like building it for yourself. Yeah, you know? I love it. Great way to get this thing started. So your story is really unique in the sense that you, your pathway into hospitality isn't the, the traditional pathway. And I love getting guests on, like you on the show because it just proves that it doesn't matter your background. If you're passionate about the industry, you can penetrate. You can get into this industry. You don't have to spend years in restaurants before opening, you can figure it out. So where did it all start for you? Take us to the point where it makes sense to start your story. Well, let's see. <laughs> you know, I came to New York to work in, in movies, you know, and I was working as an assistant cameraman, but I wasn't paying the bills. So I was waiting tables at a little restaurant called Bar Six. And um, at the time, you know, I really missed, I was starting to miss, I was working in a restaurant, I was becoming disenchanted with the film industry believe it or not. And I was falling more in love with the restaurant industry because that's where all my friends were and stuff. And I ended up meeting the designer, this guy, Ian McFeely, who's the designer of the restaurant. He also designed this giant French restaurant in New York called Balthazar, which is huge. And uh, he offered me a job. He said, hey, you want to come work with me, you know, over the summer if you're, you're not feeling good. And so I missed working with my hands. I had this background being a carpenter. So I left and I worked with him a little bit on Balthazar, but mostly on other projects. Let's timestamp this real quick, because I know you were 27 in 2000 when you opened Union Pool. So how much time, where are we, how many years before opening? What year is it? It's probably like, um, let's see, that was 2000. It's probably like 96, 96. 97, okay. right in there. Okay. And um, yeah, basically I was living in Williamsburg, which was just like a den of nothingness back then, you know? <laughs> And I was building these beautiful like restaurants in the city and I'd come back to Williamsburg and every time somebody opened even like a kind of a dive bar in the neighborhood, everybody throw them like a parade, like you are a hero, you know? Yeah. So like, and I was, I was just seeing the opportunity here. You know, I was thinking, God, like, you know, there's all this beautiful stuff in the city and nobody's bringing any kind of that beauty to Williamsburg. You know, I was like, there's no like little stuff. There's no restaurants with like banquette seating that would be comfortable sitting, you know, there's like these really simple things. And so, um, I got approached by uh, my good friend, Ray Abeda. He said, I said, you know, I've, he's like, why don't you open a place with my wife, Alyssa Abeda? And um, her lifelong dream was to open a bar. 
And I thought a bar was a good place to start. And that's where we uh, decided to jump in and do Union Pool. So let's dial it back again. Uh, so you come to New York, you're in your early to mid 20s. And yep. you're working for Baltazar. You're working with Baltazar. Oh, no, I'm not working with Baltazar. I'm working with this guy, Ian McFeely, yeah, okay. who's a designer, who uh, was one of the key designers on Baltazar. He also designed so you were working chillers. with Ian to build out Baltazar. Yeah, I was kind of like a project manager. I was nobody. I was like a $15 an hour carpenter, you know? Okay. But yeah. I, I like to spend time during the come up, that, and this is what got you into the industry. This is your first right. kind of time. You said you were a dishwasher maybe before that. Yeah, waiter, dishwasher. Worth getting into stuff. that? Nah, <laughs> okay. I was bad at all those jobs. So I think feel like this is like the the trigger that got you back into hospitality, yeah. right? Um, and you, you had that that background in construction. Now you're getting that design. And I think you're one of the things that makes you real special is your eye for your d design and mm -hmm. that ability to d design. So any lessons, any key experiences that happened during this time at Baltazar working on this team to build out that restaurant that really sticks with you, a, a lesson that you can share with us? Yeah, I mean. You know, Keith McNally, Balthazar is one of the restaurants in Keith McNally's world. And I mean, definitely, you know, you hear people say all the time that a design is in the details. And I think Ian and all those people on that team, you know, design is the details. And I think that the other thing that I really learned during that time was how a space, um, how a space dictates the flow and the social nature of a, a room and the success of a restaurant. I don't think enough people really understand what can be achieved by how you place your tables, like where you push people together, where you, where you create chaos, you know, like if you look at all my restaurants and bars, like it's chaotic when you walk in, you know, I do that on purpose because I want people to feel like they're in a busy space with a lot going on. Right. But then, you know, when I lead them around the corner to a back room, it's like quiet. So you can have a quiet experience, you know, like people are out to be social, you know, they want to be pushed together in nice ways, you know, like, so, um, you know, yeah, I mean, Union pool, is notorious for being a place, a bar where, you know, people meet up and like hook up and it's got this like notorious, you know, 20 year racket where like people like go there to like meet each other and stuff. But I think a lot of it just has to do with the way people are flowing through that space, you know? Mm. And it's one, yeah. I want to go into a, a little bit of a rabbit hole here because I okay. feel like you, this is kind of your, your sweet spot, right? This is, this is your jam, the design, right? That's and you're already it. dropping a few lessons on us. People want to feel like they're in a busy space. People want to be pushed together. So, can you give us any like tricks of the trade things we can do with the space? I know it's a very specific question, yeah. but anything along those lines of things we can do with the space to, to make it have that feel that it needs to make people feel like they're in a busy space and together. Yeah. Just generally, you know, in like say a tavern or restaurant, you want to put your points of interest around the perimeter, you know, that way when people are walking from point A to point B, like say somebody's going to the bathroom, it's great to have them walk through the bar, you know? Uh, when people are going to get a drink, you know, you want them to, they're going to the DJ, they're going to the photo booth, the pinball machine, the backyard, the front yard. You need to have these like these hot spots where you have a lot of paths like crossing through because then people can like bump into each other, you know, yeah. and then you get that chance for organic meeting. You run into a friend. You're like, hey, I didn't know you were here. If you just put people off in corners, you know, and they never have a chance to walk through the restaurant, there's no vibe. There's no mix, you know, like how's a boy going to meet a girl, a girl going to meet a girl, a boy going to meet, you know, how's any of that going to happen, you know? You need to be able to hold the door open for somebody, spill a drink on somebody, you know, whatever it is, you have to create organic, you know, interaction. So and flow. getting those points. So the, the big takeaway, getting those points of interest around the perimeter. So you force people to walk by the interesting things. Um, you mentioned the bar, pinball machine. I mean, the, the bathroom is probably a really great point of interest. Almost everybody that comes to your restaurant or, or bar is going to hit that bathroom. So yeah. how can you make them funnel through the restaurant in a way that shows off what you got in Right. Sure. You want to I mean, that? yeah, I mean, bathroom, it's like a trick that everybody knows now in New York, but you know, you got to spend the money on your bathrooms, you know, first of all, you got to take care of the ladies and you got to take care of women. You know, they want to, they want to, even if you're in a divey place, if you have a clean bathroom, like everybody will go there and feel comfortable there. But also if you come back to the table from the bathroom and you've got a story to tell, everybody else is going to get up and go walk to the bathroom too. You know, now it's like blown up and everybody's making their bathrooms like all about Instagram and self portraits and stuff. But I think definitely like, you want people to return to the table with a story to tell. Like, did you see what's around that corner back there? It's crazy. Or did yeah. you, the bathrooms are insane. They're like, what, why are they, you know, they, they don't even have to make sense anymore. They could just be something crazy, you know, but I definitely like to um, respect when people go away by themselves to like 
take a moment and like create some solace there, even if it's in like Union Pool, which is a pretty rowdy kind of, you know, on the verge of becoming a dive bar place. You know, the bathrooms are really nice. We try to take care of people there. It's important. Awesome. Um, any other like nuggets on design that are worth getting into before kind of getting back to your story? I mean, I'm sure we're going to have other opportunities to bring st stuff to the surface later, but I don't want to anything that's like just itching at you to get out <laughs> in design wise. Yeah. Um, let's see. I mean, one of the one of my favorite sayings that I, you know, that I've been saying a lot lately is that, you know, a camel is a horse that was designed by a committee, you know, <laughs> like you don't want to open a camel, you know, you want to open a horse, you know, so I guess like what that saying is like, you know, a camel has all these different things attached to it, right? It's got the humps and the knees going backwards and stuff. <laughs> and like, so I think that, you know, when you go to build a restaurant, you know, like you have to have a real vision of what it's going to be. It's like one of those things you have to basically see it in your eyes operating the color the fans twirling the music playing the smells in the kitchen the way you're welcomed and then you're basically going to go into like a war right to, to open this thing for like you know three months to two years or whatever it's going to take but it's your job at that point to hold on to the dream and open the place that you promised yourself you know so I, I mean, there's tons of, if we start talking design, I can just go down rabbit holes, oh, but I, I know, but I, mean, I, I try to, I try to hover over the, the areas that really light people up, my guests or the areas of yeah. expertise for my guests. And I feel like we'll probably come back to this as we go on. Yeah. Um, it's definitely but, one of the things that I fell in love with about New York restaurants was that ability to be transported when you open a door, you know, and what and I'm it, hearing from you is just being intentional. Don't just like yeah. throw things around, be intentional, have intention with where you're putting things and, and think of, put yourself in a guest position oh, man, right? all the time. Uh, right. I'm loving this. I'm loving this. So let's bring it back to the timeline. Uh, you are in construction, you're helping uh, build out a restaurant and then you get this idea that take it from there. Yeah. I get approached by, um, my good friend, Ray's wife, Alyssa. She's like, I always wanted to open a bar. Let's do a bar together in Williamsburg. At that time, I was kind of doing, helping other people with their restaurants and bars in Williamsburg, building, you know, kitchens and just doing carpentry kind of stuff. Uh, so we started looking. Uh, Alyssa found this space that was on the other side of the BQE at that time, which was like off limits. Nobody went to the second stop on the L train or past the BQE. It was like this, un this dividing line. Williamsburg was literally from the freeway to the water, you know? So um, I loved it because I thought, you know, this was like 20 years ago. And I'm like, Williamsburg is dead. It's done. It's over. <laughs> you know, like we got to go find new territory. So we went over there and, uh, you know, we opened that spot and uh, it was a freaking, you know, a nightmare. You know, we basically uh, borrowed <laughs> money from everybody. I would have borrowed, Let, I would have borrowed there. money. I would have borrowed the, the nightmare. All right, we're back, and you were just about to tell us about this nightmare you had uh, opening a restaurant. So take us to that point. I mean, actually, this was a bar. This was Union Pool. Oh, sorry. Um, That's right. Thank you. It's been open 20 years. It's become an institution, I think, in the neighborhood. But back then, we were little known, you know, nobodies on the very perimeter of a kind of bubbling up-and-coming neighborhood. And, um, you know, we begged, borrowed and, borrowed, and stealed anything we could. You know, we each put in a chunk of money. I built the restaurant out myself. And uh, I like to dive into this how to get the money part because I feel like yeah. this is a huge challenge for a lot of people. And we all have to go through it. So yeah, how like take us through what you learned, like w what approach you took, and how you how you got the capital to open. I mean, back then I was just starting, so I was just like we literally borrowed all the money, which turned out to be the best thing ever because we actually ended up owning all of the restaurant at the end of paying everybody back. So, I mean, at that time, it was extremely stressful, but I remember my partner and Alyssa and I sat down and said the best thing we ever did was just limit this business to two partners because it became very successful like four or five years later. And the only two people that benefit, you know, the only two people that we had to dis make decisions with or distribute money to was the two of us, you know. So if you can, <laughs> you know, if you can do it without a lot of investment and a lot of partners, I think that's great, you know, because if you think you're going to be successful and you shouldn't go into the restaurant business, if you don't think you're going to be successful, you know, hold on to as much of it as you can. So real quick, I'm curious, um, what things do you think you did as far as getting the money, um, to open your restaurant? Like what advice do you have? What, what, what things worked well for you in that approaching others for the capital to open the restaurant? I think, uh, you know, the first restaurant's the hardest, you know, cause you don't have a track record and you have to just go on like, you know, your skills and what you've done. You know, I think I was bringing a lot of the construct. I was basically going to be able to knock down the cost of the construction because I was going to do a lot of that myself. Um, I had a track record of, of doing design stuff around the neighborhood and stuff. So 
I mean, I still have never had any investors in any of my projects. You know, my partners have always been my investors. But I think going forward, like once you start getting above, you know, a, a number that you can't afford to risk yourself, you have to reach out to partners. But, you know, as you get a track record, you become more successful. More people want to be like part of your train, you know. So I would start small. Don't overextend yourself on that first project, you know. Yes, that is great. You I know, think like, people, like, they have this vision of their restaurant, what they want to have someday, right? Yeah. And they set out on day one to get that thing. Yeah. And the people, like, these, like, you're comparing your restaurants to the Union Square hospitalities of the world. It no. took time for these people to evolve their restaurant groups and money investors. It doesn't happen overnight. Start where you can. Keep your liabilities as low as possible. Yeah, and you can start, like, a, you know, you can start a brand that could be in grocery stores off a taco truck if you yeah. do it right, you know. I think that, you know, one of the things about all restaurants is that you're basically managing expectations, you know, the higher you set the expectations with the design and the hype and the, the feel of the place, the higher you have to jump when people come in the door, right? Like the kind of like the trick is like set low expectations and overachieve, you know mm. what I mean? Like everybody loves a dive bar that has amazing food or a diner that has incredible food, you know, it's like a great place to start. So it's like, let it be at the focus be on the food. Don't distract people with like crazy design and stuff like that until you're ready to like achieve on that level. Yeah. So let's talk about your partner because, uh, I've noticed that you have a lot of partners, uh, in, mm -hmm. in your restaurants and in your, uh, your bright side hospitality with yeah. your consulting, there's a lot of different players. So when you are approaching people to work on a project, what are you looking at? What was it about your first partner? Uh, her name's escaping Alyssa. My, Alyssa. Yeah. Thank you. That stood out to you and, and gave you that gut feeling that she would be a good person to go into business with. Yeah, I think, I mean, you're looking for people, right, that have strengths where you have weaknesses, right? But then you're also looking for people that, you know, morally, like, you know, it's like going to sea with somebody on a boat, you know, or getting married to somebody. It's really, it's a real serious commitment, you know, and I think that uh, that first relationship, you know, and partnership with Alyssa was like a huge learning experience for me. You know, I think at first it was, it was really hard. I didn't realize that I was how deep we were going to be into each other's lives, you know, and like, we're going to, we we're both in debt together. That was very stressful. But then, you know, later on we got to share that success together. So I think, you know, your freedom and your sanity is like lies in your partner's hands. You know, like sometimes I see new partners get in this like competition, this like work competition. There's so much work to do in a restaurant. It's like, I'm out working you. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. And it's like, no dude, no, it should be the opposite. It's be like, how can we create less work for each other? You know, yeah. how can, how can I work hard today? So you can take two days off. So when you come back, I can take two days off because ultimately if you just sit there and just beat your heads against the wall, dude, you can't create any vibe, you know, you yeah, can't create yeah. any happiness in a room if you're not happy. You know, it's like, so I think that, you know, I mean, yeah, you're basically, you need to know what you're good at, but also more importantly, probably know what you're not good at and look for partners that have those strengths. I love that. Uh, and to, to kind of go back on what you're saying with uh, uh, being supportive of one another, but like make that a core value, write these things down. Yes. So when you drift from not being supportive of each other, you can call each other out and say like, you know, look, this is what we said we we're going to do. This is what's important to us. We got to, we got to, you, you can't drift from those things that will help keep you afloat in the long term. Um, you said some things were really hard for you in the beginning. Get specific about what was really difficult. Well, I think that, um, you know, when I opened Union Pool, all of a sudden I realized that I'd opened a business that was going to be open seven days a week till 4 a.m. every day. You know? And I was just like, oh, what did I shit. do? <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, you know, like, so you so, can't relax. I mean, when you own a bar, when you first now I can relax and have multiple businesses and I'm not like worrying about all the little details and the, you know, the, if there's a fight going on somewhere or something like that. But in those first like month, you know, you're just obsessed with like, what's happening over there? I'm not there right now. It's really hard to sleep. You know, it, it played a lot of, you know, it was hard on my relationship at the time. And uh, how'd you push through it? How, what, what did you do to start you know, gaining traction and to rise above the challenges? I think I just, you know, I think it's like you said, I turned to my partner and we both realized that we needed help. We had to help each other, you know, and I think that we offered each other breaks. You know, I think that it was, it wasn't necessarily harder to run the business with just one of us than with the other one. So the other, I think Alyssa might have said this to me first. She said, why don't you take a trip? You know, I wanted to go to California, like build a house with some friends. She's like, why don't you take off for a few months and do that? That'd be amazing. And it was amazing, like gift, you know, and I never thought that was even an option. Yeah. I think also like you'd be surprised at how much your partners want you to be happy and how much, you know, you want your partner to be happy. So if somebody just, if you're just honest with each other and you're just like, I'm just so stressed out, I'm not happy. I'm feeling your partners will just like rise up and be like, dude, you know, like you need to get out of here. Like go for a week, come back, you know? And then when you come back, you're feeling great and you're like, you get out of here, you take a break, you know? So I think that 
I think just not trying to get into like a competition of who's providing more for the business. Realize that like when your partners has shortfalls that they might step up at some, you know, some point down the road and just crush it for you, you know? Yeah. And this topic of partnerships is one that is super intriguing to me just because the, the industry is getting more and more competitive and you need yeah. to be good at so many things to yeah. be competitive in this industry. And unless you are a freak of nature, you're not going to be good at all those things. So yeah. how, how do you cover all the bases? You, you find people who are good at those things and the market's so competitive for people right now. How do you get the good people? Like you need to offer them equity. They need to have skin in the game and the other variable with partnerships too. Like, like you said, like that mental health is so important. Taking breaks is so important. And when you have somebody else who has skin in the game, they're going to show up. You know that they're going to show up and have that same standard, that same expectation as you do. And that must be such a relief to, to be able to go and to know that your partner has your back. Yeah. Uh, do you want to reflect on that? I mean, I agree with everything you just said. It's like, you know, you also like, how do you grow, you know, like going back to that first business, you know, I realized I was just going to be stuck in that one bar my whole life, <laughs> seven yeah. days a week, unless I figured out how to embrace the partnership, but also how to create like a management team. Like how could this place run itself? You know, how could, how could Alyssa and I get out of the day-to-day -day operations and then move on? Well, to there we go. That's the next, yeah. the next subject. So how did you build that management team? What was that process of building this team? Like, cause you, you were running, um, just for a little context, you had union pool going from 2000, still going to this day, but from 2000 to 2008 before opening hotel Damara, uh, Damano. Del Mono. Yeah. Um, so it took you, uh, you said, you said it took about five years to get to that point until it was yeah. profitable. So take us through that evolution and how you started removing yourself from the day to day and, and what things happened to make it profitable. Maybe you were yeah. just paying back. I think it was, it was probably about three years, but I think at five years is when we really started cruising and mm -hmm. we had that freedom. Take us through that evolution. Yeah. I think that, you know, I don't think that Alyssa and I were very good managers day to day. We were super passionate and we were really good at like getting a team behind us and getting a team invested in us. And a lot of those original employees are still at Union Pool because they believe in the place and the place has grown organically with them. But I think, I think that, uh, you know, Alyssa and I realized, or I realized I wasn't going to be able to do anything in my life if I was there every day. So I, basically that's when I first realized that I need to start looking for people that were better managers than I was. So and what, I, what was I, it that made you not a good manager? <laughs> I think that, you know, well, you know, I get emotionally invested in how great everything should be, <laughs> you know, like, and, uh, I'm also just not the, you know, I'm not the, like, you know, counting the money, checking the details, you know, going through the, you know, the closeout sheets. It's just not what I'm good at. You know, I'm better at, you know, the, the overall design, the passion, the way the room should feel, the way that servers should, you know, like the whole, the whole vibe, the whole front of the house upstairs in the restaurant on the floor vibe is my strength, yeah. you know, like, but when you get into the office on the Excel sheets and stuff, it's like, I'm like, oh God, it's not why I got into the business. But when I realize when I meet somebody that's super talented in that area, I'm just like, you're a stud. You're yeah. amazing. Like, who are you? You know, <laughs> no, like, it, I'm like, whatever, you know, we got to pay this person top dollar. They're right? amazing. You I, know? But I think it's also so important to do what you did, which is recognize where you're not good and be okay with not being amazing at everything and, and then getting out of the way as soon as you're willing to admit that. Yeah. And then to find that rock star who loves sitting in an office and entering data. Like, yeah, some and people they're, they're, they're out there. They no, like they're that. out there and they crush <laughs> yeah. it. And, yeah, they, you exactly. know, it's a team sport. Like we said, it's like, you can't, you know, some people are amazing on the floor interacting with customers and some people are great in the back, just analyzing the data and crushing it. And then they love, and that's where they're comfortable. They, they don't, they would, you know, if you took that person from the office and put them on the floor, they'd have a nightmare. You know, they wouldn't want to do that. You so know? The, I can gather that the, one of the first things you guys did to, to scale and to evolve the operation is to start delegating uh, the things that you don't like to people who or things that you don't like and that you're not really that great at to people who enjoy it and excel in those areas. What yeah. I basically just crunched the numbers a little bit and yeah. said, Hey, let's each take a pay cut. I don't know if it was $500 a week or, you know, 50,000 a year or something yeah. like that. I said, let's each take a $500 pay cut. I think that in six months from now, we'll both be making more money than we do now. If you because, are able to, because I don't think we're managing this place properly. Yeah. And I think that not only will we have way more time, but the, the staff will be better supported and ultimately will make more money just because like, to be honest, I knew I wasn't a good manager, but that Alyssa wasn't doing a great job at that point either. You know, we needed somebody to come in and be there day in, day out, offering support to the staff, pushing the staff, pushing the business, interacting with the customers, you know, after a couple of years, you can't stay 
you're not at your bar checking in at three or four in the morning anymore, you know? Yeah. I mean? So who knows what's going on there? So, so, so after you got the support, what was the next step? I think the next step was just like kind of supporting that there was a real opportunity to expand the business at that point because we had kind of only opened up in a quarter of union pool. So we, uh, we were able to kind of expand the business. That was one of the amazing things we doubled We had two bathrooms, right? And this huge line for the bathrooms, we doubled our bathrooms and we doubled our sales in three months. So wow. <laughs> never underestimate the power of more bathrooms if you're busy. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we basically pushed in we opened the music venue in the back of union pool. So what happened is basically the manager came in and gave us time and space to think more big picture. And by having that freedom, we were able to create more business for the space. You know, we expanded the, the venue. We also expanded, um, you know, the courtyard. We brought it, we craned in a taco truck into the backyard. It like became a whole thing. So, yeah. you, know, you know, the business grew because we had that space in our mind. And, you know, it, it doesn't happen overnight. It takes time to, I think people try to too soon to get all these systems uh, and processes and people in place. But the truth of the matter is you, there's a, probably going to be a, a few months to a year or two where you're in it doing everything and figuring yourself out, figuring out your identity. And then once you get it locked in, start replacing yourself with other people. But it takes time to know who you are and what you're doing before you can replace yourself. Right. Oh, yeah. like, so like take that time to figure it out and then transition out, get those people in there. And then once you get those other people in there, it's going to free you up to then work on your business. And I think that's where people go wrong is they, they, they get some free time instead of working on the business. They go take a break, go home right. and, and rest. But like, well, you that's important too. <laughs> it is important, but you also need to like put that pressure on and sure. to redirect your time and energy to, to doing these little things. Like we need more bathrooms Like we can work on this yep. project and that project to, to increase the revenue and make the, the business. Well, I better. think one thing you just said that I totally agree with is like a restaurant is a conversation between the restaurant and its clientele, like over time, you know, so you have this idea of what you're going to open, but when you go to open the restaurant, you know, now, now opens this now conversation reality. between yeah. you and the public yeah. and what they want and what you want, like Hotel Del Mono across the street, right? It's a, it's a cocktail bar. You know, when I opened it, I was like, I'm not going to serve Budweiser, blah, 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 <laughs> and all this stuff. I'm serving cocktails. I'm serving that. Th I've come to find out like some of my best friends all drink Budweiser. So I was like, well, I definitely got to put Budweiser in here, you yeah, know? So yeah. you just have to make you know, you have to figure out what kind of place you're going to be. And you can't be too rigid because it's an open conversation, right? It's an evolving place, you know, like if it doesn't, if it stops evolving, then it's dead basically. Yeah, and there's you know? always that conversation of, do I make it all what I want or do I just give the, the customers all what they want? And right. there's definitely a balance there. If right. the answer is yes, yeah. you find a balance. Like you, you gotta, it has to be an extension of who you are because it's your place. And you, you don't want to lose your identity. Exactly. But you also need to, like you're there to serve. So you, right. have to, you can't forget that either. So. Yeah. Do uh, you want to add to that? Did I cut you off? No, no, not at all. I totally agree with that. You can't, you can't go so far off your track that you become like, you know, trying to appease everybody and go back to that thing we said where it turns into a camel and you've got, yeah, yeah. you know, Thai spring rolls and, you know, burgers and every, you know, just trying to do everything for everybody because then you lose your identity, you know, and that's, that's. That's the death nail. For I'm loving the, the conversation, but I feel like we need to like move it into uh, okay. more of your future because we're st we still got three restaurants to cover and, and your your hospitality consulting group to cover. So anything else from the, the, the first restaurant, Union Pool, or sorry, the first uh, business bar, uh, venue, concert yeah. venue uh, that you can share with us? Um, any key lessons that really impacted who you are today? No, just that you know your staff and your you know your staff is your probably your biggest partner, you know, it's like you've got your partner, but then you also your staff, you know, like I said, a lot of the people that were there originally are still there today, you know, and then like they've kept the spirit and the soul of that place going while I've moved on to other things, you know, and the love is still there when I go back, you know, I think that everybody wants to be offered it. You need to grow and expand and do other things. But this, one of the things that I'm, you know, we'll talk about this probably later, but you know, how do you move forward without everything crumbling in your exactly. wake? You know what yeah, I mean? Without, yeah. without something really good, just falling behind you. So I think union pool has done a great job, you know, on its own in a large, in a large, you know, basically to just like keep going, be strong, be true to who itself, even though I've moved on and done other projects. So it's an amazing place. So it it's was still a good bar. It was 2008 <laughs> uh, when you opened a uh, hotel. Dem I don't Del know Mono. why I'm struck. Del Mono. We, Del Mono. We made up the word, so it's hard to say. Uh, hotel <laughs> Del Mono, uh, 2008. And I know that uh, Judd was uh, one of your, um, vet or what's the word I'm looking for, patrons at the union pool oh yeah he worked he worked down the street at a restaurant called dumont so he was a uh, bartending and serving there so he used to him and his wife kathy used to come by all the time union pool he says he got uh kicked out of there a few times i wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised knowing judd <laughs> but um yeah well judd went on to open five leaves in greenpoint which is an amazing restaurant uh complete institution now and the two of us were kind of jumping back and forth but the two of us just partnered up to open five leaves in la we opened about three weeks I ago saw so that. really exciting 
Um, so take us through the, the evolution of, of the mono and Del how, yeah. how this came into frame and how the conversation started and how you actually pulled it up. Yeah, I think, you know, going back to authenticity, you know, Union Pool, I built when I was like 26, 27 years old. That was the bar I wanted to go to when I was 26 years old. Yeah. You know, it was just like, it was like, we kind of were one of the first people to just start those like, you know, PBR and a shot, Tecate. We were all on that wave. <laughs> and I think for that next eight years, everybody in this neighborhood was doing the same thing. It was all about Jameson and PBR and shots and blah, blah. And I kind of outgrew that a little bit. And I started we're getting... We're not 26 forever, right? Yeah, we're not 26 <laughs> forever. I started, you know, I started being inspired by... You know, I was traveling Argentina architecture. I was looking at Cuba and I just started, I was going to cocktail bars in the city, starting to have better service and getting more into wine, you know? And I was like, God, it was that same thing. I was like, why can't I have this experience in Williamsburg? You know, yeah. like why, you know, Williamsburg is like a little town at that point next to the city, you know? And I was just like, God, somebody should, you know, we need a little bar that, you know, um, there was no bars that had table service. You know, there was no bar where like it would, you just had to walk up to the bar and get a beer. There's no bar where they come over and ask you what you want, you know? So I was like, wouldn't it be cool if we did a little bar? I'd been in Argentina, Buenos Aires, and like amazing like cafes and amazing service, you know? And like, and I was just like, God, it'd be so cool to do something like this in Williamsburg. And so that was the dream, you know? So, so Hotel del Mano is a cocktail bar, revolves around an oyster program and raw bar, you know? Uh, and has an amazing, you know, old world wine list. Actually, a lot of new world stuff too, but you know, it's... You know, we like, I think we pre, we were too early for the neighborhood by about like three months. You know, people would just look in and be like, what is that place? They think they're so <laughs> fancy in there, blah, blah, blah. You know? well, what I love um, from your story and something that comes up a lot is that you literally look across the street at Del Mano from, um, actually, but you were at Union Pool first. So yeah. maybe it happened the other way. Yeah, yeah. Um, but how far is Union Pool from here? I know it's I mean, all, it's like four blocks down this so way. You know? th the point is like, um, and then Danny Myers. Uh, did this too is mm -hmm. when he was scaling his business he wanted all of his businesses to be within walking distance from each other yeah. so like you can get around so you can have that presence and it's really yep. important to have that presence early on while you're still trying to recreate yourself and others right and to to you know yeah. evolve and build your people you have to have that presence so was that in the back of your mind when you were looking at the, the location for Delmano? it's close by was that important to you yeah i think also i'm just like a small town guy i grew yeah. up in petaluma california it was like a small town so i kind of think locally like I'm more connected to my friends that are around me than I am to the ones that are like, you know, moved across seas or something like that. So I, I think, you know, I'm kind of like, Oh, like wherever I am, that's where I'm at. I'm like, Oh, what's going on over there? Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. know, like we should do something cool over there. Like I really interested in what's happening directly around me. I'm not like, let's take over the whole world, do union pools, you know, in Japan and stuff. And you know, people offer that, but I'm like, why would I want to fly to Japan to open a bar? <laughs> well, I think that yeah. time can come. And I think you're, yep. you're kind of doing it now with opening a place in LA, right? Yep. But it takes yep. time to build that foundation yeah, and that definitely. culture around you. So yep. it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, and that's until you, until you build that foundation, you've got to be able to, to have that presence in all of your locations. Yep, the right. same thing happened here. So when you're at Del, Ma uh, Del Mano, uh, literally dining all across the street, two years later, you open Cafe Colette, which right. is where we're sitting today. Um, and it's that, that presence is so valuable, uh, but bringing it back to, uh, cafe or sorry, hotel, Del, Mon Del Mono. Del Mono yeah. Thank you. Um, tell us how you actually pulled that off. So, so did the space come, become available? Uh, did that happen before or after approaching, approaching your partners? Take us through that process. Yeah. I mean, the space had become available. Some friends of mine had like a, a really cool kind of hip antique shop there and actually helped them rebuild the storefront. So I knew. I knew the space and they basically vacated without paying their rent. So I went over to the landlord and I said, you know, I've always wanted to open a bar in this space. It's beautiful. And she said, you know, I've already got a bookstore that signed a lease. And I'm like, why would you want to put a noisy bookstore in here? If you could put a nice quiet bar downstairs, you know, and she basically, I tried to sweet talk this Polish lady into letting me open a bar there. And she finally agreed. Um, I told Alyssa, my partner at Unipool, what I was going to be doing. She jumped on board. She nice. was like, she's like, I want to do it with you. It sounds so fun, blah, blah. And, I, you know, and our partnership at that point was really strong. You know, we, you know, we loved each other. We support each other. We trust each other. You know, it was a great, it was, there's no brainer. It is, it's a marriage. You no, know, it was yeah. a no brainer yeah. at that point to go into another partnership yeah. together. And then our, th our other partner, there's three of us involved in that. Uh, Michael Smart jumped on board. We all knew each other. We'd lived in the same crazy loft building in Brooklyn and went through like all kinds of stuff there. So, and he was a master craftsman. Uh, he does restoration of antiques and stuff. And so the design that I was thinking of, you know, with this like Argentinian, Cuban, marble, mahogany, brass, cocktails, like otherworldly, you know, at that time there wasn't a lot of this like um, decomposed architecture, you know, European, South American influence places going on. So it was kind of like one of the, it was the first cocktail bar for sure in Williamsburg and probably one of the first places that had that kind of design thing. I think you see a lot of that now, mm -hmm. but Michael was like a 
an obvious partner to come in and like help out with that. I mean, he's a master, you know. So, so he you had in. Michael Smart in Al- Alyssa. Alyssa. Um, what, what what did Michael have specifically that that kind of rounded you and Alyssa off? Like, what were you missing? What piece did you need? To- I think that uh, Michael Smart is like he's super solid, like stick to itness. You know, very consistent. Um, he's very level headed. I might be a little bit emotional, like all over the place. Like we gotta do this. We gotta. He's a little bit more level headed. Um, he's uh, fastidious about the like, you know, the details and all the, you know, the upkeep of the place. So he's like over there doing it. And Alyssa was like the social element, you know, like brought the team together, like created the family, the vibe, and all that kind of stuff. So I think he's been a great addition, you know. Did any of you guys have craft cocktail experience at this point? Because that's like a, a whole like. No, <laughs> like, like except me, I drank a lot of universe yeah. knowledge and, no, and no. expertise that you need. So how yeah. did you make up for that that void? Uh, how did you get that person that that brought that element to the team? Yeah, I think we um, was our first bar, bar manager was this, was Jeff Taylor. Let's see, who was it? It was uh, it might have been Sam Anderson. Anyways, you basically looked for that person. Yeah. I was out drinking all the time at all the cocktail bars, finding recruiting. that you know, finding that yeah, recruiting, <laughs> doing the hard work to get that person over there. Yeah. And it turned out a lot of the people that were working at some of the high end bars were actually living in our neighborhood, you know, so I knew them because I'd been going out and stuff like that. So it was pretty easy to find that bar manager. And we started with like, a, you know, now our menu is like huge seasonal changes four times a year. We have a whole, you know, people come up through the line of, you know, bar back, head bartender, bar manager. So they learn all that stuff. But before, you know, we just we only need a couple guys who weren't that busy, you know. Yeah. OK. Um, so take us through the actual opening of, of Hotel uh, the Mono. Uh, is it Demono or Del Mono? I Del Mono. Know. Yeah. Jesus. Del please. Mono. Right. Del Mono. Um, <laughs> or the Delano. Is right. So <laughs> That's op- in Miami. <laughs> opening Hotel Del Mono, once you got it open, were there any challenges that you didn't see coming? Any new curveballs that... Yeah, we were dead. To- Nobody wanted to come there. <laughs> so how did you change that? <laughs> well, I think that we were just like a little ahead of the curve. Like I said, everybody was doing shots and beer at the time, you know, and then, you know, like nobody really was thinking cocktails, you know? Yeah. So we actually, we wouldn't get busy. I remember we just sit in there and eating Chinese food till like 10 o'clock and then we'd get slammed from 10 till two. You know, that was when all our friends got off work from their restaurants would come over. And I think what was happening, it was just like, there was a shift that was happening and maybe- You were we, definitely ahead of the curve. We were a little yeah. bit ahead of it or interested in what was happening because we, you know, all our friends were in restaurants and bars. So, you know, when you taste a really, good, like now everywhere you go, they make a good yeah. margarita, a good I tequila gimlet. probably you like know? 2008, like, 2009, 2010. Everybody was using Rose's lime juice back then, you know, yeah, and being like, this like, is a margarita. And you're like, what Right the around hell? like 2011, yeah. 2012, like that craft cocktail, like yep. the, the farm to table started to come up and like it, that like bled into like scratch bitters and all that stuff. And like that yeah. world of cocktails really right. started to evolve around that time. So your timing was amazing. Yeah. Really. Once you had a great drink like that, there's like basically no going back, right? Yeah. You're just like, no, they should all be like that, you know? So was it just patience? that won the war just waiting for the the mark the the market the industry to kind of catch up to craft cocktails or did you get creative with promotions how did you know you know ultimately it was also it was almost kind of like a labor of love like union pool was going remember i said the second one's almost so much easier than the first one yeah well it's true because i didn't i was making my money off of union pool so there wasn't a lot of pressure for del mono to be really successful and i always thought it was going to be like i didn't realize there was going to be a cultural cocktail like a you know, revolution that was going to happen. Everybody's going to get into that. So I always thought it was going to be like maybe 10, 15 guys, you know, had some girlfriends just drinking fancy cocktails, you know, you know, wearing suits back in the day. But then, you know, cut to, a, you know, a year or two later and there's like a line out the door and, you know, we're waiting, you know, you have to wait to be seated kind of thing. So I think that, you know, like you said, I was just fall off, you know, following something I was interested in, generally interested in and excited about. And then everybody else just gets caught up in your enthusiasm, you know? So anything that's worth uh, hovering over, going into detail, any lessons to take away from Hotel de Mano uh, before talking about the next project, Cafe Colette, that is worth diving into? Yeah, I mean, Hotel de Mano does something really interesting. You know, it's like it it hunts for this like fuzzy line between a cocktail bar and a great bar, you know, and it's like a great bar is not a place that serves you the best drink you ever had. You know, a great bar is like a place where like you want to go to every day, you know, like one of the things about New York is people use bars and restaurants as like their living rooms and dining rooms here. Like I have friends that I've known for 10 years, like never been to their house, you know, it's like, (laughs) so people associate themselves in their lives, like with your restaurant, you know? And so, um, you know, there's definitely bars that make a more refined cocktail than Del Mono, but are they a better bar? I don't know. Cause Del Mono is pretty damn good, <laughs> you know? So it's like, you know, I want people in Del Mono, you know, talking about their relationships, politics, 
love, art, war, sex, you know, breaking up, falling in love. I don't really want them like, you know, dissecting the cocktail, you know? So we push to do great drinks, but at the same time, we don't go past the line where it becomes like obsessive or gets in the way of the experience of just being at a bar. Cause it's a beautiful, I mean, especially now, you know, with all of us looking at our iPhones all the time, you know, it's a, we, I think we're all looking for that genuine experience of just sitting in a restaurant with a friend or something that's really important. Well, I think you're also tapping on a little bit of the, the psychographics of the space that you create. And people want to identify. Like you said, it's like an extension of their own home. Uh, it's their living room. So yep. they want to go to the place that aligns with their own values and how they want to be seen by others. Yep. I'm going to go to this restaurant because they have the same values and the same beliefs and the same style that I have. So I, so people will see me in here and think, well, that person's fashionable. That person has these values. And then when you're, when you, when you know what your brand is and you scream your brand and your, your beliefs on, from the rooftop, like you can attract onto yourself, those people that have that same uh, viewpoints that you do and you can build your tribe. Do you, yep. want, do yeah. you agree or disagree? I or? totally agree. You know, I mean, I'm looking for the places that I like have a little bit of chaos in them and they've got a little bit of mystery in them and they've got a little bit of magic that you don't know. You know, my favorite type of restaurant is when I walk in and I don't, I don't get it, you know, like I don't understand like what the deal is, but then I sit down and have a meal there and it's like, I have the best time ever. Cause I know there's something like going on in that space that I can learn from, you know? So there's like magic, you know, some, there's all these different ways that you can make it work, you know, through like your social dynamic with your staff, through the, uh, you know, the environment, through the service, through the food, you know, but it's a balance of all those things for me. You know, it's a balance of the, the design and the space that you're in, the service that's, you know, being provided, the vibe, you know, basically, and the food and the drink, you know, it's those three things in balance. And if you're strong in one area, you can be weaker in another one. Beautiful. So two years after Hotel de Mano opened, you uh, across the street, diagonal across the street, opened Cafe Colette mm -hmm. with addi two additional new partners. Yeah, well, one partner is is my wife, you know, Erin, yep. you know, so she's a partner, Erin Gherkin. And then, uh, yeah, Julie Park, who's our other partner. Yeah. Yeah. So all these partnerships, man, like, yeah. and again, like, I'm this is one thing I'm curious about. Uh, and it's something I saw big time in Richmond, too, with people sharing partners. Yeah. It's like a polyamory, like restaurant, like partner thing going where everybody mm -hmm. just, it's just cool. Like, these, this is my partner. Like, you're strong in this area. And there's somebody who's opening up a restaurant that's weak, maybe back of house, but you're strong in back of house. Right. So you're going to go open a restaurant with them. And I'm not going to get jealous. Yeah. And I guess that's what I'm trying to escalate into, right. which is when you're sharing partners, how do you not get jealous if somebody's attention gets pulled to go over and work on that project? And you have partners in like yeah. four different projects, at least right now. Yeah. So yeah, like how's like get into that, that dynamic and how to balance partnerships. Yeah. I think that, you know, I was always looking for like really individual spaces that were different. I wasn't trying to open like a chain where it's like the same thing again and again. If I was doing a replica, I would definitely keep the same partners, you know, mm -hmm. because it would just like, you could move the talent over and you could share chefs and management it makes it so much easier. But I was looking for an original experience. And I think, you know, um, a lot of my partners in the bar didn't want to go into a restaurant, which was cafe Colette, this business. Um, but I did have some people that wanted to do it with me. So, you know, I don't get jealous with, you know, I'm, New York is an interesting city. Like people don't really get so jealous. Everybody just wants each other to like push each other forward, you know? So and I think, I don't know what it is about this city, yeah. but everybody's like, yeah, you can do that. Let's do that. You know, like, great, I think it's the people that have that mentality. If yeah. It's about us. It's communal. I'm not jealous. It's a, it's a, we, not me versus you yeah. that always go ahead. Cause it takes collaboration. It takes being open. It takes partnerships to pull things off today. So yeah. keep yourself open, have that open mind. Right. Um, I couldn't have done cafe. Remember what I told you how bad I am at management and all that stuff. Like basically yeah. couldn't have done it without help. <laughs> yeah. you know? So it's like, so I had to reach out to somebody, you know, what, how did this conversation look with Michael and Allison when you were with leaving? Alyssa and my, oh, sorry, think, Alyssa and my, yeah, Alyssa and, and Michael. I think that, um, yeah, at the beginning there might've been a little, you know, I just put it out there. Yeah. I was like, Hey, I'm thinking about doing the restaurant across the place, you know, across the street with, you know, actually the guy that owned the restaurant here before me approached me because he was like this guy, Vin, he had a, a Vietnamese sandwich shop. It wasn't doing great. And he was over a regular at our bar all the time. And I remembered back to when his sandwich shop used to be this great restaurant called Osnott's Dish. And I was like, God, that was one of the best restaurants in this neighborhood. We should go back in there and turn it into a restaurant. You know, he's like, let's do it. You know, so I think that they were, you know, I, there might have been a little bit of tension, but we all got over it and worked it out, yeah. you know, so. So, uh, talking about opening Cafe Colette, uh, take us like, this is, you know, your third operation, right? Anything that you did differently because of the experience going to this, that maybe you've had to figure out the hard way with the first two operations. 
Yeah, no, actually, this one was a really hard one. <laughs> was it? What, what made it hard? What well, did you because it was actually, the, I think, the first real restaurant, you know, where yeah. we really brought food. And we were open breakfast, lunch, dinner, and brunch, you know. So we were open all the time. Food was involved. I was used to these, like, you know, these profit margins that you get from alcohol, you know, where you can basically, you know, maybe run a business at, like, 20%, you know, beverage costs or something like that. And there's there's money in there to be a little bit, you know, try experiment. But, you know, within a few months, I think we were in like a $80,000 hole to our Oof. vendors or something like that. And I was like, OK, it's time to go to restaurant school. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so we basically so had to sit down and really like, you know, start drilling down on the food costs, the labor costs, all those things. What were the know? key lessons when you went to restaurant school and you started uh, taking in these consuming all this knowledge? Well, like, how did you start addressing the, the, the weak points and plugging the holes? Essentially? Yeah, I mean, really, my partner, Aaron, really got in there with me and did it. But we basically just had to like you know, set goals for, you know, for food costing, set budgets for ordering, um, really look at, we had to look at things week by week, basically, you know, how much was left over at the end of each week and then look at our payroll and just figure out ways to be creative with the design to limit payroll, you know, like, Oh, could we move the espresso machine by the front door so that the, you know, the barista could also be, you know, the host for a little mm. bit, or should we move it behind the bar? So the bartender can be the barista, you know, how could we, you know, get creative with the layout of the space to get through these tough, you know, these tougher times. Yeah. And just yeah. constant evolution, right? Like yeah. don't set it and forget it, like set, set it up and then ch constantly try to find a little, like a two seconds saved here, three seconds saved there. And oh, over just tweaking time, all the time, it just compounds, right? Yep. Just um, tweaking all the time. Do you remember where you went to, to get this knowledge to, to seek out how to create a budget and how to lower your food costs or, or I think I was margins? just like reaching out to like everybody I knew, you know, basically reaching out to bookkeepers, and um, actually, that's when I really got Erin, who was my partner, but I got her really involved because she had that background. She was kind of like the A student. I was always the D student. You know, <laughs> I was like, OK, we got to get the book smart people in here, like figure this out. So she got involved. She really crunched the numbers. We should probably ask her how she did that. But, um, <laughs> yeah, there was no like we didn't. I basically always use people. You know, I'm not really one to go out, like find resource like books and stuff like that. I usually go hunt for people. Your network is your network. Yeah. You know, and yeah. I think that's one thing that's beautiful about the human species is we we're we're tribal by nature and we don't have to be amazing at everything. But if you know that person who's yep. strong where you're weak, you know, cultivate relationships and, and try to add value to their life with opportunities and that, that given that take in that support from one another is just so powerful. You can never underestimate your network. Um, so what else was hard about cafe Colette? Take us, you said the having to actually manage four meals or sorry, three meals. Uh, so the food for the first time open all day. What else? I think also like not, I didn't go into it with a real strong identity, you know, like we kind of can let's like, just open a restaurant and serve, you know, burgers and stuff like that. And then we got bored with that really quickly, you know? So I think it was one of those things where if we, you know, when we went forward from that, we realized how important it was to have that really strong identity, what you were to the community before you opened it. So we had to kind of figure that over time, you know? Uh, we also had our, our partner then Vin involved, who was like the chef and, um, you know, had previously run the Vietnamese restaurant. So we had a lot of like cooks in the kitchen, so to speak. So we had to sort it all out and streamline and figure out how to like get down to business and make it work. So now you have three functioning operations at this time in 2010, 2000, right. yeah, 2010. Uh, one thing that we mentioned earlier is uh, the, the how important it is to keep the love like in your in your operations and. Um, how, how much of a, a presence did you have at this point, say at union pool, were you still there? Like, how did you, I guess, how did you build the love up to be working on these other projects with, how did the love keep continuing to flow without you being there? Yeah. I mean, union pool had an amazing community that was built around it because of the music venue too. And we basically built the music venue for our employees because <laughs> a lot of them were in bands, you know? That's cool. So there was a, there was, and then it turned into a thing that was constantly bringing in fresh blood and fresh energy and all this stuff. So uh, union pool was under a great uh, general manager at that time, uh, Sage. And uh, he basically kept the love going, you know, he kept the management going, he kept everybody involved. I was going over there, but I wasn't there. I wasn't walking in at like 2 a.m. and like, checking things out. And I think that I'm sure there was some slippage, you know, like, cause you can't, you know, like in the business, you can't be there all the time. But I think also like, you know, that's what makes a great bar. Great. is like, there needs to be a little bit of like, you know, give and take. Yeah. There. I got to dissect that a little bit. I think from the very beginning, like you set the standard, like you, you look to your manager and you gave them the freedom to do what it is that they need that he or she was a he or she, uh, where over there, Sage, Sage, he, he. Yep. so, uh, what Sage came in, you gave him the opportunity to 
to you know take the bull by the horns and to yeah. kind of like own it a little a little bit. And I love what you mentioned. Um, you weren't even going to do music, but you did that for your your employees because they <laughs> wanted it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. To me, that that blows my mind. But I, what I, what I can't help but think about when I hear you say that is that you're now your employees, your 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 general employees are owning it too because yeah. you're giving them this vertical to express their passion, the, to be able totally. to, to ho house these venues. And talk about the importance of how that injects love into your business. I mean, yeah. I mean, when you hear a great idea, grab it, you know, like, you know, I think the, the employees, I think were the ones, I'm not sure it was specifically that came up with the idea to mu do a music venue, but we'd done some pop-up venues. We had this huge room in the back we weren't utilizing. And some of our employees were in these great bands, you know, so yeah. That's that's power right there. You yeah. have you have a demographic of employees who are like infiltrated into like this this uh, community of musicians. And when you can get your employees to go out and network and then bring people into yeah. your business, like wow. Yeah, I mean, I mean it's amazing. Union Pool that venue holds about two hundred people, but you think it's probably bringing a thousand people, and maybe out of those thousand six hundred have never been to that business before, right? So they're yeah. going through there every week. You know, Don't, just people yeah. flowing through and, be, and people being like, I love this space. I'm coming back. So it keeps it alive. It keeps, you know, blood going. Just creating opportunity and, and don't undervalue the the significance of your your team members. They, oh, they can pull so much value from their networks, their passions and inject it into your business. That's yeah. And their passion important. can still be going 20 years later. Yes. And or like Union Pools, maybe not where I'm at right now because I built that when I was 26. But then there's still people there that are passionate about their musicians that are still involved and people that are still involved like one of our bartenders is this amazing photographer you know his photography you know a lot of it revolves around union pool and the culture there you know there's a really strong culture there and a culture can like outlive you and outgrow you which is incredible you Beautiful. know any other way to inject the love into the culture that's worth mentioning things that you guys do in your operations that we can share yeah i mean i think you have to be you know loving and supportive of like your staff and like when people are having hardships there has to be there has to be flexibility for the individual. You know, you have to be, you know, Lissa, my partner was, you know, she passed away a few years ago, about three oh, years ago, sorry pancreatic cancer, um, which is a killer, obviously. But, um, you know, she was such a lover and uh, we, there was always room for the individual and there's always room for like some, you know, if somebody needed a fundraiser for medical stuff, we would do that at Union Pool. You know, there was like a real community and a family there. You know, if like, if we were all, you know, devastated about a hurricane, you know, hitting Puerto Rico, we do a fundraiser, like whatever people wanted to do, we were down for that. You know, the business would do small loans for people if they needed help with things like you can't ignore that you're part of that community. And the community actually was the thing that I think Alyssa and I realized that was like the most beautiful thing we built. You know, I think we opened that restaurant or bar to like make money. Yes. And then we built a crazy community and we were like, this community is like amazing. You I'm know? loving this, man. It, I am loving this. And it's that like love like that 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 culture that loving culture is so transformative and, when, and that's why i love small business because of that transformative loving culture yeah. uh and i think that's you know when i kind of bash on bigger operations because i think when you try to replicate something over and over and over again with each new location you're kind of diluting you're pulling from that 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 love you know it's a yeah. it's a finite amount of love that you can give and then when you start diluting you start just spreading that love out and it just becomes yeah only you know it's, it's very thin love you know but, yeah no totally. um but I, you know i don't know i think i'm people, i mean we're tri i think you're right no we're tribal and but we also try you know we gather around spaces you know like so union pool has its tribe and there's crossover with del mono and stuff but there's different you know they have pride in what they do at union pool and and then our employees and the people that come to del mono have pride in that place you know and like you know there you yeah we couldn't i tried to start like a little del mono in the back of union pool you know i was going to do cocktails back there and then i was like what am i thinking you know you can't you know you can't change a horse midstream kind of thing like i gotta go do this somewhere else you know yeah and everybody at union pool was not having it either they're like no take that somewhere else you know that's not <laughs> so what we're about i think we have to leave a little time to talk about um bright side hospitality yep. so at what point did you say to yourself we need to have a restaurant group did it start first as a restaurant group or was it more to focus on the uh, ability to to leverage your knowledge and your experience to offer consulting services yeah well i think that you know basically uh judd was going is out in la he was going to open uh, five leaves la reached out to me i said i'd love to be a partner with you and then we also partnered up and we're working with the hoxton hotel here locally now so we just literally a block away we're doing three restaurants yep. in there, Klein's, The Backyard, and uh, Summerly up on the roof. And so I think that it was a way to open that restaurant in L.A. together 
and then also do this project for this for this our hotel client that we're working with and then we just realized man we have all this talent we have these like chefs we have these bartenders we have craft cocktails we have everything we have design so we might as well just like launch a consulting business with that yeah you you know why not right? yeah why not create that other channel or you, you've pulled this team together uh, why not give an outlet for that energy of this team that you, you pulled exactly. together and yeah. to help other people out in the process yeah um any advice for doing exactly that if, once you've been in the the game for like 10 15 20 years and you've, you've built this team what, what advice do you have for somebody who might be wanting to form a restaurant group or any legalities that are worth thinking about when forming a group and then tr transitioning to maybe getting into consulting that we can hover over yeah i mean uh consulting is it just depends on you know how you want to do it. consulting can be like the best job in the world because you could be the one that's in in charge of like all the fun ideas and the stuff but also you don't have the same control you have when you're doing like your own project you yeah. know so if it's you're a little bit of control freak like me yeah. it could be like a little bit like ah <laughs> like you know um but no i think it's you know starting a consulting group is a great thing to do you know it's like it allows you to leverage you know your um like your talents across different businesses so judd has owns five leaves here in Brooklyn. I have these other ones, but we can, in our restaurant group, we can share all those assets and all those individuals and we can like plug people in and pull people out. So I think it's just a great way of like, you know, expanding your horizons and doing more cool things. It also just opens you up to like bigger, broader projects, you yeah. know? Man, I've loved this conversation, but I want to make sure, is there anything that you were hoping we would talk about or anything that, uh, that you can provide a, an area of expertise that you think could really help transform our listeners. Uh, anything we can dive into before moving on to the speed round? <laughs> um, no, I just hope that, uh, you know, so I shared some knowledge and motivated oh, some man, people, you, you know, amazing. like, um, you know, don't, you know, the restaurant, you know, like I said, you know, um, don't lose sight of your quality of life. You know, if you're not happy, you, you can't make people happy kind of thing, you know, just the basics. So the last question I want to start asking all my uh, guests during this free flowing portion of the interview is um, about your transformation. So the mission statement of Restaurant Unstoppable is to inspire, empower, and transform the industry. So how have you transformed over time? Who is the Zeb today versus the Zeb in 2000? Um, I think the Zeb today is more thoughtful, um, a little bit more aware that I don't know everything, more open to, you know, inspiration and influence from outside, more willing to take advice, you know, a little bit slower, softer, more thoughtful, hopefully. Awesome. <laughs> Definitely times when I'm not like that, but that's who I'm aspiring to be, you know, like going forward, you know, like, um, yeah, definitely trying, I love to it, man. trying to grow, you know. I love it. Great, great stuff. One more break. We're back, and the first question I have for you is what is your it factor, a habit, a trait, a characteristic you believe most contributes to your success? I mean, I think it's that I get emotionally involved. <laughs> you know, I think that, um, you know, like I can, I just really am invested in the way things feel. You know, if the music's not right, I just, it's, I personally like panic. You know, yeah, like how are you it, dealing with that? Um, I mean, it's probably like my worst trait too, which is probably your next question, <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, I, what, I'm removing myself from the day-to-day -day management. So I'm not, you know, walking in and somebody's on their phone. I don't have a heart attack and be like, we're all, the whole restaurant's going to fail. You're on your phone. <laughs> you know, where Aaron, my wife could just walk in and be like, you know, Taylor, put away your phone, please. Thanks. And for me, I'm like, you know, I have to go run around the block or something. So no, I think that, um, yeah, I mean, being emotionally involved is like a wonderful thing because it means you're passionate about the way things feel and stuff. You know, I love hospitality. I love, you know, throwing dinner parties. I love like going all out, you know? Um, but you know, being emotionally involved is important, you know, and I think it's, it's something special. So the next question is what is your biggest weakness? So you can go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Being emotionally involved, <laughs> yeah. too emotionally involved. Right. Uh, yeah. I think that, you know, at some point it could be a hindrance, you know, like you don't, you don't need to get emotionally involved in little yeah. things like put away your phone, you know, or, or things that can be corrected. Like, you know, let's bust that table and stuff. But I think if you really care about hospitality and you want people to have a, a good experience, I think that, you know, you can feel. Um, you can feel horrible when they're not going right. And, you know, in restaurants, there's a lot of opportunity for things to go wrong. So, so what's one question you ask or thing you look for during the interview process? You know, by the time it depends on who I'm interviewing, like a chef, a server or whatever. But by the time usually I'm sitting down to interview somebody, they've kind of already ticked all the boxes that they have the skills to pay the bill, you know, like they're basically talented. So I'm usually looking for somebody, you know, like with warm eyes. I feel like, you know, somebody can make a connection. 
and somebody that I'm willing to spend a lot of time with. So I'm usually asking more just kind of general questions about like, you know, like, you know, what, did you go on any trips this year? Well, just trying to connect, you know, and seeing if they can connect because the restaurant business is about um, personalities and connections. So I'm looking for people that can like make those quickly. You know? Great. I love it. What is one of your biggest challenge to, challenges today or your biggest challenge throughout your career? I think, you know, what we were talking about earlier, how do you move forward without like all your past things just crumbling behind yeah. you? You know, I mean, obviously the work life balance, but I think I've, I've usually been pretty good at that. But how do you move forward and do new projects without leaving your past projects saying like they've been like abandoned? So how, how are you doing with that? Uh, I think, you know, you have to go. I mean, a lot of, you know, what you do when you're not involved in the day to day is just like sharing the love a little bit and letting people know you appreciate that they're like, you know, like I go back to Union Pool and I'll be like, God, this is still a great bar, you know, and I'm like, and I can't attribute any of it to me anymore. You know, it's like 20 years later. I mean, I built it, but I'm not there making it great right now. It's all these other people. So you have to make sure to go back and appreciate people that yeah, are keeping like, things going. And you know? reinforce the good. And I think too often we only speak to people when there's bad news or, yes. or they're doing something wrong and try to find opportunities, reasons to point out the good with no negative feedback, but only good feedback. Yeah. And that's so powerful. Yeah. I love 100%. it. Um, what is one code of conduct or behavior you teach your team a way to be a way to act? I mean, I think in New York, a couple of things. I mean, I think in New York it's like, you know, you never know who you're talking to, you know, like there's this thing that I think we've all run up against, especially in cocktail bars and stuff like that, where it's like, the bartender like makes you feel like an idiot or something like that. It's like, you never know who you're talking to, man. You never know. This dude could be a freaking brain surgeon, spends his whole life saving people's lives. And now you're the asshole that just gave yeah. him like read him the right, right about, you know, rum or something like that. So I think, um, definitely like you never know who you're talking to give everybody a chance, you know? And then I think the other thing is like, you know, there's a line, you know, that it's okay. Like if a customer is just horrible, we don't need them to be our customer. You yeah. know, I'm totally fine with just being like, Hey, you know what? dinner's on me. Like so, as soon as somebody starts insulting the staff, it just doesn't belong in our community or our tribe. Like you say, I'm like, let's just let them go. Like dinner's on us guys. Please don't come back. It's, it's okay to break up with the I customer. Mean, yeah. If they're, it's if they're okay. ruining the mood of your team, that's yes. going to affect the, the experience for other guests. If your team is being totally. dragged down and, and you know, it's just not worth it. It's yeah. just not worth it. Um, so what is one uncommon standard of service you teach your team? This is a way to go above and beyond, uh, what's expected. And I think that, you know, thing I say a lot is like, we got to fight for our clientele, you know, like, like once people come in, you have to like create, you know, when you open the doors and you have a great customer, a great couple come in like, we have to let them know we want them back. You know, like you have to go above and beyond, especially when you see something like at Del Mono, it was kind of like a hip young person. I used to see like older couples come in there, like amazing, like coming from the opera or something. I'm like, we need to buy them a wine. I would make sure I go over and say hi. Cause I wanted them back. They made the whole room like light up by being there. You know, your clientele will define the space. And I was like, you know, I tell our customers all the time, we got to fight for our clientele. We got to fight for our regulars, like make it. them own this place. Great stuff. What is one book that's a must read to make us a better person or restaurant owner? Oh, this is a, such a weird book, but you, know, you guys only <laughs> have to read one chapter in it, but it's this book, a pattern language. Uh, it's about, it's a building book about towns, building construction, but has an amazing chapter on public spaces, restaurants, and taverns. And it basically just says, and I don't think that anybody can be successful in the restaurant industry if they don't understand how people flow through a space. And basically this, a pattern language book tells you basically how people emotionally respond to the space that they're in. So Ooh, it's pretty cool. That is a good And one. I think it's only 10 pages. You have to I want to check that out. <laughs> yeah, what check name out. The, the name of the book one more time? Uh, a pattern language, uh, by Christopher Alexander. We even have a printout. There you go. What I is that? I, I can't it. even read all these names, Here, but I'll, I'll hold it up to the yeah, hold it up the to the camera, camera there. there you go. <laughs> it's a pretty nerdy book, awesome. but <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, I will have a link to that in the show notes. This is episode uh, six hundred and twenty-three, so you can go. I definitely don't think you should read restaurant books when you take a break from the <laughs> restaurant. <laughs> so uh, restaurantunstoppable dot com slash six two. Three. And the next question I have for you is what is one thing you feel restaurateurs don't do well enough or often enough? I think travel, like travel internationally, travel afar. I don't think you can create authentic experiences if you don't have authentic experiences mm -hmm. on your own, you know, and I think travel is probably one of the best ways to get real authentic experiences. It also takes you outside of your comfort zone. You get to see how people react to you as an individual, but mostly like you get to see how if you're interested in hospitality, 
it's done all over the world in different ways and you get yeah. to say see new ways to do it better ways to do it man. booth perspective super inspiring yeah, travel perspective travel is travel totally underrated for sure um all right what is one piece of technology you've adopted in your restaurants that's had a huge impact on operations communications efficiency profitability anything along those lines uh the same thing as everybody social media you know like, <laughs> i fought it for as long as i could but then when you realize like the potential of it it's just like it's unstoppable it's go very, one layer deeper what's one thing that you're doing in your rest or your your operations yeah uh that is really leveraging the the power of social media i think it's just like you know letting the community know that you're hearing them like the people that are coming to your place like staying in touch when they're gone also pushing forward the services that need more attention like like at Cafe Colette, we were like really busy for dinner, but not so busy for lunch. We started pushing lunchtime, you know, food, everything vibe through social media and like basically doubled our lunch sales in a year just through social media. So I think, you know, you can you can shine the light on the places that need attention. I can't remember the number exactly, but you have something around 23 thousand uh instagram followers at colette, at colette yeah. yeah colette so is definitely the most like engaged of my spots i think the other spots luckily are just kind of busy and full most of the time yeah. i think colette we were like more you know working it much harder so there. You, you gave us great advice on what to do once you've built that following once you have twenty thousand yeah. twitter follow or uh, instagram followers um you know push the services that need attention but how what advice do you have for building that following what things did you do creative things that you can share with us yeah i think i mean you can get in the nitty-gritty of instagram i'm not the best person to tell you that but Where's it's Aaron? like it's consistent <laughs> it's consistent posting right yeah. it's it's showing it's stories so people can just like that's popping up all the time it's uh linking to like other you know a lot of times it's just linking to people that are coming through your space that have a hundred thousand followers those type of people letting them know they came through that you appreciate them blah blah, blah. you want to see them back you know I mean, Instagram is all about just being engaged, you know? Mm. So if you don't want to do it personally, like, you know, get somebody that's better at it than you to do it. Yeah. And, and that's kind of like where I'm at with this, like social, like I personally, like transparently 100% am not a fan of social media. Yeah. I don't like living in my phone. I yeah. don't like living in technology. I like to like live in my head and just kind of exist. Right. Yeah. But I do have to recognize the value of it. And I think it's again, the, the again, the, the power of partnerships, the power of empowering your people and delegating yep. and finding people that are good at stuff and then giving them free range and say, go get them. Like, this is you, this is your lane, do it. And like, that, that just makes people own the work so much more. And, and there's always a way to, to do what we, we got to do. Get creative, right? Don't yeah. just like, no, don't I want just the experience your... in the room to be a genuine, yeah. I only care about the experience when you're in the room, yeah. but to get people in the room and like attract them to the room, like you need to like, I mean, it's just amazing. It, you can't ignore a, you know, a tool that basically can reach everybody in the world for free. I mean, it's like, right. it's powerful. Yeah, it's powerful. So this is the last question. It's a doozy. Are you ready for it? Uh, I guess I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> if you got the news, you'd be leaving this world tomorrow. All the memories of you, your working, your restaurants and bars would be lost with your departure with the exception of three pieces of wisdom you could leave behind for the good of humanity and for your legacy. What would those three pieces of wisdom be the things you know to be true? I think I would just keep it simple. I'd say, you know, do what you love or don't do it. Um, love who you're with, you know, when you're with them. Um, you know, be kind to strangers. <laughs> Zeb Stewart, man, I've loved this conversation. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Uh, we wrap up every chat by calling somebody out, and that's how I connected with you. Uh, Tim, I, for some reason, her last name is not, it's Tim the Girl, uh, is how I remember her. She knows who I'm talking about. Uh, what's her last name? Help me out. Well, you put me on a spot like that? Uh, I just go as Tim the Girl, too. She's famous. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, Tim the Girl. Um, she calls you out. And, uh, She's Tim the Girl on my phone. I think that's <laughs> yeah. how it all got started. Uh, that's how I found you. So now it's your turn. Call somebody out. Who do you respect and admire? Oh, uh, man. I, last year, I had the honor of working uh, on the design of uh, Frenchette with um, uh, Riyadh Nazar and Lee Hansen. I think you should go give those guys a tap on the shoulder. They're uh, amazing. Um, the new restaurant tours, they just opened this wonderful restaurant, Franchette. It just got a James Beard Award. I mean, it's awesome. I like the way it looks because I worked on it, but uh, <laughs> uh, they're going to do great things. And they have a huge history, I think, probably over like 20 years plus in the city running amazing chef team restaurant. They're badasses. Drop their names on me one more time. Uh, that would be Riyadh Nazar and Lee Hansen. Riyadh and Lee, look out. I'm coming after you. I'd yep. love to get you on the show. And let the folks at home know, how can we connect with you if we want to maybe come join your team? Uh, maybe we want to come use your services, design services. You guys do everything yep. for Brightside Hospitality. What's the best way to connect? Yeah, you can look us up, brightsidehospitality.com, or just link up with me. Maybe 
DM me on Instagram. I think that's probably the best way to do it. All right. And again, uh, Zeberino is my Instagram handle. Again, this is episode 623. Head over to restaurantsunstoppable.com slash 623. I'll have a summary of today's discussion, a link to any tools, services, books recommended, and how to connect with Zeb over there. Again, Zeb Stewart, thank you so much, my man. There is no thank question. Thank you, Eric. That you are awesome. unstoppable. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate it. Thank Cheers. you. Cheers. Cheers.